Come on, put your hands together and say a great big God bless you to our musicians today. Thank you so much. Well, this morning we're continuing this series that we started last Sunday morning. The title was Fulfilling the Mission of the Church. Fulfilling the Mission. And of course, last week we looked at the text from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there. We'll be going back to that text today and then also in the writings of 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, really verses 6 and 7. But this is just a great opportunity for us to kick off the fall. And I hope and pray that you'll do your best to be here for the next sequence of Sundays because these are all going to be connected and there's not a more important topic than what we're going to talk about today. So uh, go ahead and touch your neighbor and just tell them, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> so we want you to do your best to be here and to be a part. And to help us as we endeavor to reach this city and to make a difference in everyone's life. And, of course, we're going to leave the comfort zone again. God has a way of pushing us out of the comfort zone. I know he's done that with me, and I've watched him over the years do it again and again and again. And so we're going to do our best to hear him, open our heart to him, and uh, have him do the work that only he can do. So, leaving the comfort zone, fulfilling the mission, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And then he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so we looked at that last week in a broad sense. We talked about each of those. Jerusalem, what is that? And then all of Samaria, what does that represent? We talked about that. And then even to the end. And that was our primary fo focus last week because we were looking at missions. And this is a great missions-minded congregation. And so today we're going to go back and look at Jerusalem and we're going to do our best to shrink that down. We looked at it in a broad sense last week from the standpoint of this, this church right here at Kings Highway and Jaeger and then how that the ministry fans out from here in what we call Jerusalem. And so this Sunday, we're going to go back and try to shrink that down to just two people. Two people. Husbands and wives. Husbands and wives. Now, if you're here today and you're not married, maybe you are a widow or a widower. Maybe you're divorced and you're single. Or maybe you've never been married before. Here's what I believe. I believe that the Bible has something to say to all of us. And so the primary focus of the sermon today is Christians. Christians. Here's another way I'd like to describe that is believers. Believers. And so just let me, let me get an idea. How many believers are with us today? How many people are believers in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And so I would say that's the greater majority of us. Almost everybody here is a believer. And here's the thing. We have to have something that guides us. Something that is our map or the, the blueprint, if you will. And so what we're going to do is agree together, as many of us as possible, that we're going to believe the Bible. Believe the Bible. And so as we believe the Bible, God has some specific things that he wants to say today. I just want to tell you real quick, I'm not trying to be a movie star. Uh, there's something going on with the, the light board or something, and so they have a spotlight on me this morning, and that's very uncomfortable to me, so God is moving me out of my comfort zone. <laughs> so I don't want anybody to leave here and say, oh, the pastor thinks he's special, because trust me, I don't. I'm about that big. We're going to dare to believe the Bible. And believe what the Bible says about us. 
And so as I share this and unpack this sermon today, of course, I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to us as husbands. I'm talking to us as wives. Husbands and wives. And if there was one thing, just one thing that we could say is under attack today more than anything else in the world, it's marriage. And so that's why it's important for us not to just get up and share opinions or thoughts or ideas, but to actually share what the Bible says. Because that is the ultimate authority. Amen? It is the thing that we look to today. And so here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord is speaking to us about the heart of who he is and about what he wants and dreams and is passionate about for us that we would first and foremost have this power in our life. That word power comes from the Greek word dunamis, and from that word we translate the English word dynamite. And so God wants us to have this supernatural power, if you will, to be triumphant, to walk in victory, to be an overcomer, and to uh, experience him in a deep and meaningful way. And then he says that we're going to be witnesses. There is no greater way for us to witness about Jesus than in the context of the marriage. Again, is the marriage under attack? It is, isn't it? And so when, when we live before God as best we can following what his laws are for the marriage, then we'll begin to experience this great success in marriage. And there'll be others that'll want to come and hang out with us and say, how do y'all do that? How, how do you go through what you've gone through and still have such an affection for one another, a respect for one another, a love for one another? And so my sincere prayer for us, West Metro Church, is that we would become models, not so that we can pat ourselves on the back or think that we're something, but so that we can, because this society is upside down, is it not? It is a mess today. There's so much crazy stuff going on around us, and they call it normal. They want us to believe that it's normal. They want us to live in whatever that, quote, new normal is. And so the, the Bible becomes paramount in our effort to understand what God's plan and purpose is for our marriage. So here we go. This is the, the big idea or the aim. This is the objective for this sermon. Look at this. The priority of marriage. And so in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to verse 6, Peter is answering a great question. We'll unpack this a little bit more in a moment. Here's the question. What happens if I marry the wrong person? That was the question that was being asked, maybe not in those words, but from the response that he gives us, talking to the wives, first of all, in verse 1 through verse 6 and verse 7. And then he says, right here at verse 7, likewise, husbands. And so, in other words, husbands like the wives, the things that he's just spoken to them about concerning what happens if I have a person that I'm married to that's not a believer, how do I get them to come to know Christ? Or can I just divorce them? Now, of course, that was the great question that Jesus was responding to in Matthew chapter 19. When he goes back and quotes his father in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2. In Matthew 19, Jesus said to the Pharisees who were trying to trip him up using something called divorce. Who had almost normalized divorce in their day. Now let me just stop here and say divorce is a horrible thing. And it's incredibly painful. And we would never use that as a club to beat you up because you've experienced divorce. It isn't anything anybody signs up for. We go into marriage. In fact, I was at a wedding last night and I was looking at these two young people and they're so starry-eyed and I'm just thinking, Oh, to be there again. <laughs> oh, to be there again. They have such hope, such excitement, such thrill, and they're being so careful with one another. So kind, so tender, and just making sure. I watched the young man as he 
after the, the ceremonies, he's getting her to the table where they're going to sit down and eat. And he was just so careful to make sure that everything was just right as he got her there and pulled out the chair for her. How long has it been since you pulled the chair out for her? Huh? <laughs> and so, let me, let me also tell you that there was a study done. And this is across the board. And, and there are extensive studies that have been conducted about marriage. And there were just a few things I want to point out real quick. Number one is that couples are happiest, happiest in the first couple of years of marriage. What do we call that first few weeks of marriage? Honeymoon, yeah. And we try to get it to last for a year or maybe two years. And then I used to tell couples that I'm doing premarital counseling with that the best advice that I can give you as a pastor is don't come home from the honeymoon. Just stay on the honeymoon. Yeah, even when you're back and you're on your job, make sure that it's still the honeymoon. Couples are happiest during the, the honeymoon stage. And I, I thought, how sad that is. How many people have been married 50 years or more? You're here this morning. Many of you. Here's the thing. Your marriage. Yep. Yep. Praise God. We know this isn't true in America, but your marriage should be growing and increasing in respect, love, admiration, and affection for one another. But it doesn't. Here's what happens. Is that couples get married and they're ill-equipped for the wedding. They get a little bit of premarital counseling. Usually they're not even paying attention. I know because I sit with them. And I'll give them assignments. And I'll ask them, please do this homework. And they come back and they've given a, a little bit of an effort toward it. Maybe one of them has given more than the other. But it's, and, and so stop and think about this. Those of you that have a career as an attorney, or as a physician, or as a, an engineer, whatever it might be, a truck driver, in order to be a truck driver, you have to go through training. You have to go through preparation, a plumber, an electrician. Whatever the case might be, we have to be trained. There are journeymen that work with the apprentice, except for weddings or marriage our life. We just think, oh, it's just going to happen. I mean, we're in love with each other. It's just going to work out. Well, the statistics tell us that that is not true. So number one, marriage is, people are happiest in the first few weeks, first few years of marriage, because then the children come along. What happens with the children? That's right. That's right. The priority of marriage. And so the children take the priority with the, usually with the wife, and then the career takes priority with the husband. And before you know it, we're no longer being real, real careful about the way we speak to one another. Or the, you'll know what I mean, the things that we do in front of each other. I mean, if we accidentally burp, it's like, oh, we're so embarrassed. I can't believe I did that in front of you. I'm so sorry. It's like, you mean you haven't been doing that since you were a little baby? Well, yes, but I just didn't want to do it in front of you. Why? Because we're so, we're being so careful. And so, that's going to be important in a minute. Happiest, happiest in the beginning, in the first few years, children come along. And then we're told that when, I'm praying for those of you that have junior high children, during the junior high years, that is when the marriage is at its lowest so far as happiness is concerned. And so, this is America, and we believe that we are supposed to be what? Happy. I just want to be happy. God wants me to be happy. I want to say amen to that, but that's not, that's not what the Bible says. God wants us, according to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, He wants us to be full of the fruit of the Spirit. And when we have the fruit of the Spirit, we have love and joy and peace. There are times I'm not happy, but I have the joy of the Lord in my heart. I have the peace of God that transcends understanding. There's just this presence of God. So, why is that its lowest? Because we are not making each other the priority. I told you I'm preaching to me because I remember vividly when our girls were in junior high and Josh was in elementary school and there was a time we had the baccalaureate service for the local high school at our church and I met these people 
that I had seen when I had taken either my daughters to cheerleading or, or gymnastics and Joshua to soccer, and I would be by myself because Barbara would be taking one or two of the other ones somewhere else, and we're carpooling with all these other families, and we're there together at the baccalaureate, Barbara and I. And they, this two people in particular, one was a lady, another was a guy, and they said, we didn't know y'all were married. <laughs> they go, we're the pastors of the church here. <laughs> yes, we're married. Well, we never see you together. And I remember looking back, what a strain the junior high years were on our relationship, on our marriage. Now, I, have to, I, I hate having to tell you this. I do, I really hate to have to say this. But I don't want anybody going out of here saying that the pastor's done something stupid. I've kept my vows to my wife. I have. I have not been with another person. Have not committed adultery. Have not strayed from that marriage covenant that we made together standing in an altar 36 years ago. But it hasn't always been easy. It hasn't always been fun. And we haven't always been happy. Committed? Yes. Connected? Yes. To the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes. That witness of the Holy Spirit in us. And so the three-stranded cord is the husband, the wife, and God. Do you hear me? And that three-stranded cord, what's the book of wisdom say about that? It's not easily broken. So I don't want you to think that I'm standing up here preaching down at you. I feel like I'm a, I'm a fellow struggler in this walk. And I've got to say this, it doesn't have to be that way. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to look at the four laws or the four foundations of marriage. And this comes from a, a book written by Jimmy Evans. If you want to grab this book, you can, I'm sure you can go on, online and find it there. We, we have a, so thankful for our precious pastor, Glenn Roundtree, who left me so much stuff, resources and stuff. He left this series called The Marriage on the Rock. And I started reading that book, and it just really began to convict my heart that there's more that God has for us as husbands and wives. That God wants us to thrive in our 80s. He wants there to be fire in the relationship in our 80s. Not just in our teens. He wants us to be impassioned toward one another. Full of excitement and energy and belief and trust and respect and love. And so that's what we're going to be looking at as we talk about this priority. Notice what Peter says. You see it on the screen. Husbands, likewise, live with them. Look at that first word, with understanding. And then the next word is so powerful. We'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Giving. And so as husbands and as wives, we have to always be giving because that's what love is. Love gives. Love puts it on the line. Love says, I will never quit on you. Now, is it possible for people to fall out of, out of love with each other? Yes, it happens. And if that is true and it happens, it also means that love can be resurrected. We sung about it a moment ago. I got so excited hearing that song that God is able to resurrect the fire in us. He's able to resurrect the passion and the love that we have for one another. And so if you can fall, fall out of love, listen, you can fall in love. And so if you're single here today, you're divorced or you're widowed and you're still wanting a husband or a wife, God has a plan for you. And so I pray that you'll come back and hear these, these laws that we talk about. Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and, that's not the end of it, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why do we do that? So that our prayers may not be hindered. And so the law of priority, the first thing is the word understanding. And so we have to try our best to understand one another. If we will indeed put that person at the top priority and say, I'm not going to settle for this ebb and flow of the American marriage. Why? Because where does that come from? Television? Most people get their idea of what marriage is supposed to be like from television 
or from a movie screen somewhere. And where does that come from? Hollywood. Have you noticed that they have the worst marriage record of anybody? And we want to model our marriages after them? Are you kidding me? That's why we got to look at the Bible. That's why we have to take time to sit together with one another and to pray one with another and to read the scriptures together and to spontaneously at times have the Holy Spirit speak to us specifically about things in our life. And we begin to thrive together. And so understanding, this is a great statement. You may want to write this down. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. And so it is about doing our best to understand. When we're doing that, we're doing our best to understand one another We're putting them first. We're saying that you're the most important person in my life. More important than these children. That's hard for women. It's hard for the mother. Because the guy has gone off taking care of his career. And he's gone off taking care of his hobbies. And so we've elevated those things above her. And what happens is she finds her sense of esteem from the kids begins to pour her life into them. And so there's this constant tension. He's forsaken her. She's forsaking him. And there's this constant battle. Because deep within us, deep within us, we crave significance, a sense of purpose, a sense of being, a sense of belonging, a sense of love. And where we have to come down, first and foremost, at the very beginning today, is that the only one that can meet those needs is God. I want to say that one more time. Where we have to arrive on the foundation that we're going to build our marriage on is the rock. It's Christ Jesus. He is the only one that can meet our needs. The only one. And so it's unrealistic of us to try and bring that out or or demand that from our spouse. No, we're there to complete each other. We're there to be one together. And as one together, we're going to receive strength, wisdom, and knowledge from him. And he's going to grow us up together. Does that make sense? All right. So, it's about understanding. Number two, it's about giving honor. Giving honor to whom honor is due. There's nobody more important in all the world than this person. You may be here today, and you're at the point of giving up. You're at the point of saying, it's over. I can't live with this person any longer. I must have married the wrong person. And what Peter came along and said to us was that if that's where you are, then let your beauty be the inner beauty of the heart, which is, listen to this, precious in God's sight. And the way that you will win that person, even if they're as far as an unbeliever. And remember, what? does light have to do with darkness? We're talking about something that is diabolically opposed to one another. But even in that situation, there's the offer for you. Not that you have to, especially if something like adultery has been done and that person has violated the, 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 the very vow and marriage covenant that was made. Is there a biblical out of the marriage? Yes, there is. We all know that. But it doesn't have to end. And what can happen is God can begin to stir the embers and it can become a flame. And we can once again be passionate and in love with that person. Somebody ought to be shouting, amen, pastor, that's the truth. That can happen. Uh, Right here in our own church, we've seen it happen. We saw a couple that was divorced and now they're remarried. And it's just a beautiful thing to witness God moving in that way restoration. And then it's the weaker vessel. Now you've heard me say this before, maybe on a Wednesday night, as we talk about the weaker vessel, that doesn't mean that they're less important or valuable than us. In fact, it means the opposite. It means that they are way more valuable for a husband to look at the wife, because we know that physiologically, most guys are stronger than women. And so, yes, in that context or that sense, yes, they're absolutely the weaker vessel. But it's not just that way that the Bible is describing this. I love coffee. That's one of the few things I'll say that I love other than my wife or my family. But I do. I just really like coffee, especially really, really strong coffee. (laughs) And so I drink it in a man's cup. It's this mug that I can just knock around and it won't break. 
And they, they don't cost much, maybe a buck fifty, something like that. With inflation, maybe two dollars. But my wife is best compared as a teacup. And there are some of those things that cost a hundred bucks or more. Just the one cup. And they're very dainty and very fragile. And if you drop them, they will break. And so when we think of our spouse as the weaker vessel, let's try to have that image. You say, oh, pastor, I don't have any trouble thinking that. My wife is costing me all kinds of money. <laughs> She's worth far more than rubies, Proverbs 31 says. A virtuous woman who can find. She's industrious, works with her hands. She takes care of the family. She makes sure that we're all clothed. I mean, every stitch of clothes that I have, my wife has bought for me. Everything. I never have to worry about what I'm going to wear. It's always, she was coming in my office last night, hanging up clothes in my closet. I mean, she is industrious. She is ingenious. She is a master at getting things for almost nothing. I wear $250 shirts. And she gets them for pennies on the dollar. Little bits of money. And so the resources that God has entrusted to us go a long, long way, not because of me, because of her. She is far more valuable than I am. Anybody with me? Am I the only one here today that has that idea? No, she's valuable beyond anything we can imagine. And so the weaker vessel, and here, here's the biggest part of it. Peter says, and heirs together in the grace of life. Now, because we don't talk in those terms all the time, it's difficult for us to get that word grace connected with life. It's the gift that God gives to us, this great gift God gives us called life. We are in it together with our spouse. We're going to live forever with her or with him in heaven forever, ever, and ever. And so, what if I married the wrong person? How do I fix that? Well, we go back and do the things that we did in the very beginning. Do you remember when you were dating and you were trying to convince him that you were the one? Do you remember that? Do you remember how that you always were very careful? You laid out several dresses on the bed. I mean, you put them all out there and you just picked the right one. It had to be the right one. And you wanted to make sure that your makeup and your earrings and all the jewelry and your shoes and everything else matched. And then... When he was there in the downstairs, if you had an upstairs room or he was there in the room and you were coming out. I mean, the entrance was just so planned. Everything. Even how that we, we, we made sure that we had mouthwash or we brushed our teeth or, or, or we were going to make sure that everything was just right. Or guys. I mean, I know. I remember. I showed up at, at my wife's house. We were dating. Hadn't been dating long. And uh, I just assumed that we were together. I assumed that every Friday night I was going to be there, pick her up. And so I arrived at about 6 o'clock on a Friday evening, maybe 5.45. Got there and her brother Richard, I could tell he was so nervous to see me. It's like, Richard, what's going on? Oh, you know, it's just... And I said, no, no, no. After about five minutes of this, I said, oh, Richard, come here. What's the matter? He couldn't tell me. I said, is... Is she going out with somebody else tonight? <laughs> okay, all right, well, just tell her I came by. We can't assume. Guys, we have to be verbal, and we have to be specific. And so after that, she, she told me, she said, hey, you can't just assume you're taking me out. You need to ask me. I said, I thought I did. She said, you didn't. I said, forgive me. I'll make sure from now on that we do that. And so I would. I'd call her and say, hey, you got anything going on Friday night? Mm -mm. Okay, great. What time do you want me to pick you up? You think I'm going with you? I said, well, would you go with me? Yes, but you got to ask me. <laughs> no more assuming. <laughs> it's not easy for us as guys. And so, if we married the wrong person, 
or we think we married the wrong person, then we go back and do those things. It's the little bitty things, the little things that make such a huge difference. So go back and behave that way. Oh no, pastor, too much water under the bridge. It's just too far gone. No, it's not. No, it's not. If we will obey the law of priority, and we will put that person first, as if they are the most important person in our life, because here's the truth, they are. They are the most important. If we will do that, we'll obey the law. Because here's the thing, when God created the heavens and the earth, what happened? He put all these laws in order. All these laws. And if we violate the laws of creation, guess what? We fail miserably. And it's the same with marriage. If we violate this one law, this first law, the law of priority, we refuse to put our spouse first before the kids, before the hobby, before the career, before anything. And we prove to her or him that I am willing to sacrifice anything for you because you are the most important person in my life. If we will do that, we'll begin to see the marriage come together and thrive. But when we refuse to follow God's plan and we follow Hollywood's, we try to be like Hollywood, then we're going to have the same kind of relationship that Hollywood has. In fact, I just heard this week that Angelina Jolie and is it Brad Pitt? They just announced after all these years, what do they have, six kids? They're divorcing. And she says it's for the health of the family. Now, how can that be? Because they're not treating each other as the priority. So, we see here that marriage is a top priority to God. Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the King James Version says cleave, and be joined, New King James Version, and be joined to his wife, his spouse, and the two shall what? Become one flesh. Look at that. They were both naked, verse 25, and were not ashamed. And so here's the thing. We have to leave. There's not a more important relationship in all of our life than our mom and dad. I mean, we've been with them our whole life. They have taken care of us. They fed us, nurtured us. But when it comes time for us to select a spouse, man or a woman, if we're a man, we're selecting a woman. If we're a woman, we're selecting a man. Whatever the case is, girl or boy, at that point, we have to sever the relationship with our, with our mom and dad. That doesn't mean that we no longer love them or respect them. In fact, in uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, one of the first passages that we had our children to memorize, honor your father and your mother. Now, God's not going to violate his own word, and so he still expects us to honor our father and our mother even after we leave and cleave. And so that word cleave, that word be joined, is the word of connecting. It's the word of passion. It's the word where we are hanging together as one, and that you now are more important than my mom and my dad, whether it's the husband or the wife that utters those words. We have to prove that by our actions, that you, you, this person I've chosen to live the rest of my life with, you are more important than the two most important people in my life, my mom and my dad. That doesn't mean that we don't go over there and hang out with them and spend time with them. It simply means that when decisions are made, you're the most important. I'm going to spend more time with you than I do with them. I'm going to listen to you more than I do to them. And I'm going to do for you more than I do for them. Does that make sense? And so that's the leaving. And what happens in marriage so oftentimes is we refuse to do that. We refuse to leave that. And when we try to do both, listen, there's only one reason, only one reason that kids leave home today. Just one, permanently. It's to get a spouse. Now, it's a fact that children are waiting longer now to get married. My mom was married at 14. My dad was, I think, 17. 14 and 17. That would be illegal today, wouldn't it? And so today, kids are waiting until they're in their 30s. 28 to 33 to get married. It puts a strain on us as husbands and wives because we want them to get on out of the house. Why? Because as soon as all the kids are gone, guess what happens to your marriage? Happiness returns. <laughs> Hallelujah. The bank account begins to grow. Glory to God. Now we can focus on each other. 
Yeah, and so we want those little rascals to move on out as quickly as they can. <laughs> okay, be joined. Be joined. Now, this is going to be uncomfortable for you. But the first man and woman before sin, they were naked. They were. And so, what does it mean for us to be naked before each other? What does that mean? That means that we're willing to be exposed. That we're willing to be real. That's the, the word of the day. Everybody wants reality. We want to be real. Let's just be real with each other. And so when, when the man and the woman were naked before each other, there were no clothes to remove before intimacy. There was this, this thriving relationship that they had together before sin entered. And they weren't ashamed. And so they were able to share their differences. I mean, it was obvious. You could see the differences between them. They were able to share the most sensitive parts of their bodies, those sensitive things. And we have to do that as husbands and wives, to be real with one another, to share real life issues, to share our hurts, our fears, our aspirations, our dreams, to be real. And to do it in a way that we're not ashamed. And so here's the point as I conclude this morning as the musicians come. You can have a dream marriage. You can. You don't have to settle for what you have right now. It doesn't have to be whatever it is on whatever scale of 1 to 10. Unless it's a 10, you should be continuing to strive and work toward that. Now, how do we do that? We follow God's blueprint. We take the Word of God out and we begin to read it together. It was the passage in Ephesians 5 about 12 years ago. That changed the way that I see ministry, changed the way that I see my relationship with my wife, with my children. You say, wow, 12 years ago, that's not that long ago. No, it's not. And so here's the thing. God continues to grow us, continues to stretch us, continues to impress upon us what his purpose and determined plan is for our life. And so we can grow no matter where we are, what stage of life we are in right now. Here's a point. Start today. Start today, and here's what we do. We say things like, I'm sorry. It's never too late to say I'm sorry. Amen. To look each other in the eye. <laughs> Embrace one another. Or just walk in the room. Sometimes you have to do it from afar because there's this tension going on. And just kind of crack the door and say, hey, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And then to be willing to do that. To say, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Those are hard words. Very, very hard words, especially if our personality temperament is choleric. Some people call it choleric. Or a high D, if you're doing the disc. It's tough. But it's not impossible. With God, all things are possible. And then, I'm willing to learn God's plan. Let's do it together. Let's be willing to open our heart to what God has for us. Would you bow your heads with me right where you are this morning? Close your eyes. Open your heart to the moving of the Holy Spirit today. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you're not a person that has yet said yes to God's claim on your life as a son or as a daughter. And today you'd like to do that. We always give an opportunity for people because we pray every single week, especially on Tuesdays. And then on Wednesdays, and then every morning during the week as individuals, we pray that God would send people here that don't know Him. And that through the worship experience, through the preaching of the Word, through the moving of the Holy Spirit, that He would quicken their heart and they would say yes to God's claim on their life as a son or as a daughter. And if that's you this morning, we'd like to give you the opportunity to say yes to God. How do I do that, Pastor? First of all, you just admit that you're not perfect. Number two, believe what God says about you is true. That is that He loves you. He has a specific plan for your life. And then number three, confess that Christ is. Not just the Savior of the world, but today wants to be your personal Savior. So right where you're sitting, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You put your hand up good and high and say, that's me, Pastor. Include me in this prayer right here. God bless you. Include me in this prayer today. I want to give Jesus my heart. Yes, sir. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Someone else, you want to put your hand up and say, that's me. Today. Thank you so much for tuning in to our video presentation of the gospel. 
We believe that God is able to touch you where you are. And at the conclusion of our service at church, we always give an opportunity for people to accept Christ. And today, on this video presentation, we want to give you the opportunity. We've asked God to touch people's hearts and to have those that don't know Him to view this material and that the Holy Spirit would touch you right now. You may say, Steve, I don't understand all there is to know about this Christianity stuff. You don't have to. We're not asking you to join the church or do anything religious. We're asking you today to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And here's how simple it is. All you have to do is A, admit that you're not perfect. There's not a one of us perfect. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. B, believe what the Bible says about Jesus is true because it is true. And those who believe, listen, have everlasting life, John 6, 47. And then C, confess. If you confess with your mouth, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, and believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And I'll lead you in a prayer. And together, we can tell God what you're sensing in your heart right now. So you may want to bow your head and close your eyes, or you can keep your eyes open. Just simply say this prayer with me. Repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you today to forgive me of every sin. And though I can't name them all, I am truly sorry. I ask you to save me. I invite you to come into my life and change me. From this day forward, I'll never be the same. Now, I pray, Lord, that you would fulfill your divine purpose for my life. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, based on the authority of the Word of God, if you prayed that prayer sincerely in your heart, you are born again. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says the old is gone and the new has come. There are three things that need to happen now. Number one, you need to tell somebody. My email address is on the screen, steve.brown at westmetrocog.org. Send me an email and tell me today that you made this decision for Christ. And what we'll do is we're going to email you some free material. It's an ebook that will start you in your brand new journey with God. If today you're rededicating your life, you need to get back in the Word of God. Let us send you this book. Let us reach out to you and help you. You won't get any requests for money. Everything that we send you is going to be absolutely free. Freely we've received, freely we're going to give. So give us the opportunity. Number two, be baptized in water. If you're near our church in Douglasville, of course, we want you to be baptized in water at our church. But if not, we'll help you find a church in your area where you can connect with a group of people in a life-giving church, and we'll help you get baptized in water. And then number three, you need to become a part of a life-giving church. And again, if you're in Douglasville, there's not a greater church in all the world than the West Metro Church. We'd love to have you right here. But if not, we'll help you connect with a church that is near you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for praying this prayer with us today. We want you to know we love you. Most of all, God loves you. Bless you.